This percentage that's really misled by these conspiracy theories, it's unclear to me. There's millions of messages out there, you know, where my name or Dr. Fauci's name is used, but do people really believe that stuff? You know, nobody would have predicted that I and Dr. Fauci would be so prominent in, you know, really kind of evil theories about, you know, did we create the pandemic? Are we trying to profit from it? And on and on. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm very surprised by that. In fact, what it did to me is to just underscore the intensity of the divisiveness in our society. Because if merely articulating a commonly held public health message of something that every public health official in the country would agree with, because I articulate that publicly, if that triggers death threats against me, harassment of my family, my children and my wife, somebody sending me an envelope with powder that explodes in my face to scare me and my family. Boy, that tells you the depth of the divisiveness. You know, we're going to have to get educated about this over the next year and understand, you know, what, how does it change people's behavior? How should we have minimized this, either you know, working with the social media companies or explaining what we were up to in a better way? Well, definitely the presence of social media plus a pandemic is a combination that's never been tried before. I hope it goes away. I hope it doesn't hold back, you know, mask wearing or seeking out vaccines. You know, from the foundation's point of view, the fact that he took that rescission of the global vaccine money, which, uh, you know, super, super important. The fact he rejoined the WHO, the fact that he's appointed smart people, the fact that Dr. Fauci uh, will, will not be uh, suppressed. Uh, and they'll take full advantage of Francis Collins and, and Dr. Fauci, who are wonderful people. Uh, you know, in terms of the epidemic, it sometimes felt like they were the only sane people in the US government. So uh, this phase, even though you know, it's a huge challenge. You know, now we have people who are allowed to, you know, share the truth and you know, we can draw on the depth of CDC capabilities. When I was a kid, the disaster we worried about most was a nuclear war. That's why we had a barrel like this down in our basement filled with cans of food and water. When the nuclear attack came, we were supposed to go downstairs, hunker down, and eat out of that barrel. <laughs> Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. Now, part of the reason for this is that we have invested a huge amount in nuclear deterrence. But we've actually invested very little 
in a system to stop an epidemic. We're not ready for the next epidemic. Let's look at Ebola. I'm sure all of you read about it in the newspaper. Uh, lots of tough challenges. I followed it uh, carefully through the uh, case analysis tools we use to track polio eradication. And as you look at what went on, the problem wasn't that there was a system that didn't work well enough. The problem was that we didn't have a system at all. In fact, there are some pretty obvious uh, key missing pieces. We didn't have a group of epidemiologists ready to go who would have gone, seen what the disease was, see how far it had spread. Uh, the case reports came in on paper. Uh, it was very delayed before they were put online, and they were extremely inaccurate. We didn't have a medical team ready to go. We didn't have a way of preparing people. Now, Medicine Sans Frontiers did a great job orchestrating volunteers, but even so, we were far slower than we should have been getting the thousands of workers into these countries. And a large epidemic would require us to have hundreds of thousands of workers. There was no one there to look at treatment approaches. Uh, no one to look at the diagnostics, no one to, to figure out what tools should be used. As an example, uh, we could have taken the blood of survivors, processed it, and put that plasma back in people to protect them. Uh, but that was never tried. So there was a lot that was missing, and these things are really a global failure. The WHO is funded to monitor epidemics, but not to do these things I talked about. Now, in the movies, it's quite different. There's a group of handsome epidemiologists <laughs> ready to go. They move in, they save the day, but that's just pure Hollywood. The failure to prepare could allow the next epidemic to be dramatically more devastating than Ebola. Let's look at the progression of Ebola over this year. About 10,000 people died, and nearly all were in the three West African countries. There's three reasons why it didn't spread more. The first is there was a lot of heroic work by the health workers. They found the people and they prevented more infections. The second is the nature of the virus. Ebola does not spread through the air. And by the time you're contagious, most people are so sick that they're bedridden. Third, it didn't get into many urban areas, and that was just luck. Uh, if it had gotten into a lot more urban areas, uh, the case numbers would have been much larger. So next time, we might not be so lucky. Uh, you can have a virus where people feel well enough while they're infectious that they get on a plane or they go to a market. The source of the virus could be a natural epidemic like Ebola, or it could be bioterrorism. And so there are things that would literally make things a thousand times worse. In fact, let's look at a model of a virus uh, spread through the air uh, like the Spanish flu uh, back in 1918. So here's what would happen. It would spread throughout the world very, very quickly. And you can see there's over 30 million people die from that epidemic. So this is a serious problem. We should be concerned. But in fact, we can build a really good response system. We have the benefits of all the science and technology that we talk about here. We've got cell phones to get information from the public and get information out to them. We have satellite maps where we can see where people are and where they're moving. We have advances in biology that should dramatically change the turnaround time to look at a pathogen and be able to make drugs and vaccines that fit for that uh, pathogen. So we can have tools, but those tools need to be put into an overall global health system, and we need preparedness. The best lessons, I think, on how to get prepared are, again, what we do for war. For soldiers, we have full time uh, waiting to go. We have reserves that can scale us up to large numbers. Uh, NATO has a mobile unit that can deploy very rapidly. NATO does a lot of war games to check, are people well trained? Do they understand about fuel and logistics and the same radio frequencies? So they are absolutely ready to go. So those are the kinds of things we need 
to deal with an epidemic. Uh, what are the key pieces? Uh, first is we need strong health systems in poor countries. Uh, that's where uh, mothers can give birth safely, kids can get all their vaccines, but also where we'll see the outbreak very early on. We need a medical reserve corps. Lots of people who've got the training and background who are ready to go with the expertise. And then we need to pair those medical people with the military, taking advantage of the military's ability to move fast, do logistics, and secure areas. We need to do simulations, germ games, not war games, so that we see where the holes are. The last time a germ game was done in the United States was back in 2001, and it didn't go so well. So far, the score is germs one, people zero. Finally, we need lots of advanced R&D in areas of vaccines and diagnostics. There are some big breakthroughs, like the Dino-associated virus, that could work very, very quickly. Now, I don't have an exact budget for what this would cost, but I'm quite sure it's very modest compared to the potential harm. The World Bank estimates that if we have a worldwide flu epidemic, global wealth will go down by over $3 trillion, and we'd have millions and millions of deaths. These investments offer significant benefits beyond just being ready for the epidemic. Uh, the primary health care, the R&D, those things would reduce global health equity and make uh, the world more just as well as more safe. So I think this should absolutely be a priority. There's no need to panic. We don't have to hoard cans of spaghetti or go down into the basement. But we need to get going, because time is not on our side. In fact, if there's one positive thing that can come out of the Ebola epidemic, it's that it can serve as a early warning, a wake-up call to get ready. If we start now, we can be ready for the next epidemic. Thank you. Let's go to a couple of questions that we've actually received since we started the, the webcast. Uh, the first is on population growth, and the question is, one of our most press pressing issues is population growth. How do you uh, expect this to be addressed? Well, the population growth issue at the global level is not that daunting. That is, the population percentage-wise is growing slower today than in the past, and so it will actually peak out. The problem is that the population is growing the fastest where people are less able to deal with it. So it's in the very poorest places that you're going to have a tripling in population by 2050. And so their ability to feed, educate, provide jobs, stability, protect the environment in those locations mean uh, you know, they're faced with an almost impossible problem. Northern Nigeria, Yemen, Chad. Uh, and so what we need to do is take this aid generosity and this innovation and go into those places, uh, offer the women better tools where they want to space birthing or, or have a smaller family size, and improve health because it's amazingly, as, as children survive, parents feel like they'll have enough uh, kids to support them in their old age, and so they choose to have less children. Niger right now, it's still seven children per family, whereas in the richer countries, uh, you're often at, at a stable point of, which is 2.1 or, or even less. And so it's really an acute problem in a, a certain number of places, and we've got to make sure uh, that we help out with the tools now so that they don't have an impossible situation later. This, this is a very important question to get right, because it was, it was absolutely key for me. When our foundation first started up, it was focused on reproductive health. That was the main thing we did, because I thought, you know, population growth in poor countries is the biggest problem they face. You've got to help mothers who want to limit family size have the tools and education to do that. And I thought that's the only thing that really counts. Well, then, I came across articles that showed that the key thing you can do to reduce population growth is actually improve health. 
And that sounds paradoxical. You think, okay, better health means more kids, not less kids. Well, in fact, what parents are doing is they're, op they're trying to have two kids survive to adulthood to take care of them. And so the more disease burden there is, the more kids they have to have to have that high probability. So there's a perfect correlation that as you improve health, within a half generation, the population growth rate goes down. In fact, Hans Rosling uh, here at this conference in, in two of my favorite speeches actually showed that unbelievable correlation mm. that population growth has gone down. Today, where is their high population growth? It's in the places with the worst health conditions, northern Nigeria, northern India. And so the two problems go exactly hand in hand. Uh, if we improve health rapidly, we will get the peak population to be as much as a billion below the current expected peak. That is about 8.3 billion versus 9.3. We need to meet a new constraint. And that constraint has to do with CO2. CO2 is warming the planet. And the equation on CO2 is actually a, a very straightforward one. If you sum up the CO2 that gets emitted, that leads to a temperature increase. And that temperature increase leads to some very negative effects. The effects on the weather, uh, perhaps worse, the indirect effects in that uh, the natural ecosystems can't adjust to these rapid changes, and so you get ecosystem collapses. Now, the exact amount of how you map from a, a certain increase in of CO2 to what temperature will be and where the positive feedbacks are, there's some uncertainty there, but not very much. And there's certainly uncertainty about how bad those effects will be, but they will be extremely bad. I asked the top scientists in this several times, do we really have to get down to near zero? Can't we just you know, cut it in half or a quarter? And the answer is that until we get near to zero, the temperature will continue to rise. And so that's, that's a big challenge. It's very different than saying you know, we're a 12-foot high truck trying to get under a 10-foot bridge, and we can just sort of squeeze under this is something that has to get to zero. Now, we put out a lot of carbon dioxide every year, uh, over 26 billion tons. Uh, for each American, it's about 20 tons. Uh, for people in poor countries, it's less than one ton. It's an average of about five tons for everyone on the planet. And somehow we have to make changes that will bring that down to zero. It's been constantly going up. It's only various economic changes that have even flattened it at all. So we have to go from rapidly rising to falling and falling all the way to zero. This equation has four factors, a little bit of multiplication. So you've got a thing on the left, CO2, that you want to get to zero. And that's going to be based on the number of people, the services each person's using on average, the energy on average for each service, and the CO2 being put out per unit of energy. So let's look at each one of these and see how we can get this down to zero. Uh, probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Uh, that's back from high school algebra. But let's, let's take a look. Uh, first, we've got population. Uh, the world today has 6.8 billion people. That's headed up to about 9 billion. Now, if we do a really great job on new vaccines, health care, reproductive health services, we could lower that by perhaps 10 or 15 percent. But there we see an increase of uh, about 1.3. The second factor is the services we use. So this is a wish. It's a very concrete wish that we invent this technology. If you gave me only one wish for the next 50 years, I can pick who's president, I can pick a vaccine, which is something I love, or I could pick that this thing that's half the cost with no CO2 gets invented, this is the wish I would pick. This is the one with the greatest impact. If we don't get this wish, the division between the people who think short-term and long-term will be terrible, between the US and China, between poor countries and rich, and most of all, the lives of those two billion will be far worse.